In gay popular culture, J. Brine's Seven in a Barn satisfies an authentic artifact of early gay cinema made especially interesting because of its use of scripted dialogue and sound. Most gay porn films of the 1970s were silent movies with music added. In this episode, we're going to celebrate J. Brine's film, Seven in a Barn. One of the earliest documents we have of gay porn with synchronized sound, a shooting script, and male group sex. Seven in a Barn also sparked many legal issues with the government when it was deemed obscene in a lengthy battle that would inevitably contribute to the director's anxiety later in his short career. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Aike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to once again remind you to help this channel out by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Every little bit helps and I absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. Aside from being some American firsts in gay porn, Seven in a Barn was based on a 1960s popular underground gay pulp novel of the same name attributed to Samuel Stewart, also known as Phil Andros, the 70s drummer magazine author, who in the 1930s was an intimate friend of Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. This would not be the first time J. Bryan would be associated with Samuel Stewart, as Bryan also adapted Stewart's novel Stud into the film For More Than Money in 1971. Seven in a Barn was among the first feature-length gay hardcore narrative films. Unlike hardcore documentaries like Marriage Manual Films that often employed Voice of God narration, hardcore narrative productions aimed to seamlessly fuse narrative and sex, a combination that was in alignment with the contemporary youth movements for sexual freedom and gay liberation. The so-called story film format was also another way to gain the larger public's recognition of gay pornography as a lucrative subcategory of adult cinema. Hey, John, wait up! Hi. I didn't think I'd see you here. Well, what's your hurry? I'm in no hurry. Seven in a Barn starts off with a voiceover while the picture shows the cast being introduced. In the voiceover, we find out these guys have started a sex club in which they all abide by the rules of the club. We meet John, who we find out is a college football hero, and probably the best looking guy in the bunch. Peter, whose dad owns a grocery store in town. Clyde, who's quiet and moody. Jerry, who's the youngest of the group. Frank, who works at the local gas station. Teddy, whose father is a minister. And finally, we meet Bill. This whole club is my idea. I organized it, and I plan to enjoy it. The rules of the game are pretty vague, but I guess we're not watching this film to think all that much. They drink beer, they begin to play cards, and as the game goes on, some of the guys lose their shirts. Bill wins and is the leader, which means everyone has to listen to him. Once Bill is in charge, though, he wastes no time barking orders. While much of the sexual action that is worked into the narrative is oral, there are several penetration shots, and nearly every round of sexual action concludes with a money shot. And now that we're here, let's talk about that narrative. Seven in a Barn's narrative, if you can call it that, is as basic a narrative as it can get. But don't get me wrong, I can see how in 1971 this was a big deal, especially because of the seediness associated with porn loops in early gay porn films. Aside from the naked men, the synchronized sound has to be the biggest draw for audiences back then. Also, for people who love vintage gay porn but don't like the loud music soundtrack, this will be a fun watch for you. The film's own soundtrack is banjo-led country music that is introduced throughout the film. It gets loud at times, but for the most part, it is subtle enough for you to enjoy while watching. Upon its release, Seven in a Barn was a hit. A Variety reviewer described the film as a high water mark in the genre. An acknowledgement in Variety was in alignment with broader press widespread coverage of hardcore narratives, both straight and gay, that followed the box office successes of Howard Zimes' heterosexual hardcore Mona in 1970 and Wakefield Poole's Boys in the Sand in 1971. Two films that ushered in the porno chic era that has been popularly attributed to Deep Throat in 1972. From 1971 to 1972, 
Brian self-distributed Seven in a Barn through extended road showings in San Francisco and Los Angeles. He also took Seven in a Barn and the rest of his films to university settings in a quixotic attempt to legitimize his films, promoting them as documents of the current gay culture trends. When visiting one college course, Brian emphasized tolerance and education as a key function of his films for straight audiences. I just want to show I am who I am, and you are who you are, and let's have fun with that. However, Brian's visits to college campuses were not always welcomed. Due to the novella's popularity on college campuses and the film's legitimizing story film format, Brian's Seven in a Barn was initially considered to be shown in a University of California, Irvine course on varieties of human sexuality in the fall quarter of 1971. However, faculty reportedly decided not to show the film because it was deemed pornographic. In 1972, the Gay Student Union at UCI scheduled Brian to appear on a panel discussing pornography, which would include a screening. The university administration had approved the event in February, but temporarily rescinded the permission to screen Seven in a Barn following anonymous complaints during the period of the event's promotion. Early on March 9th, the administration held a private hearing and preview screening of Seven in a Barn to a group of community leaders, faculty, and administrators to decide on the issue of screening the film at a public panel. Despite the fact that over 70% of the committee members voted to allow the film showing, the administration ultimately prohibited the film screening. Brian still appeared at the GSU panel, which reportedly drew 300 attendees. Orange County Police, acting on information from San Francisco Vice, who had viewed the film, were also present and confiscated Brian's print on the basis that the film was obscene. While the film was eventually returned to Brian and no obscenity charges were filed, a Los Angeles District Court dismissed the GSU civil rights suit against the Orange County Police and District Attorney. In the coming months, law enforcement increasingly targeted Brian on felony charges that would carry stronger sentences than misdemeanor charges like obscenity. On May 7, 1972, Brian was busted again in San Francisco on charges of aiding and abetting sodomy and oral copulation and the distribution of obscene matter based on testimony by a police informant. Police seized Brian's unfinished film, along with equipment including his camera and business records. In the gay press, Brian stated he would fight the case to the Supreme Court if necessary because the aiding and abetting claim was particularly broad and would allow for future prosecutions of theaters, bathhouses, and other spaces of gay male communal congregation. After charges were again dropped, Brian moved to Hawaii and went on hiatus from gay film production and distribution. Before his leave, Brian sold his distribution rights to his earlier production, Seven in a Barn, and another film, First Time Around, to Jaguar Productions, the producer-distributor of his most recent film, For More Than the Money. In February 1973, San Jose police raided the local Paris theater for exhibiting First Time Around. A judge in San Jose also declared Seven in a Barn obscene, and Brian had to return to California to stand trial. Police charged Brian, as well as the theater's manager and owner, with not just violation of the obscenity statute, but conspiracy to exhibit an obscene film which carried a potential sentence of 15 years in prison if convicted. According to Brian and his lawyer, police harbored anti-gay sentiments towards the filmmaker as a part of a larger crackdown on California gay independent film industries. It was the appearance of Jay Bryan's name in the credits of the film and the eventual revelation that his name was a shortening of Bryan's real name, Jeremiah Bryan Donahue, which led the police to establish Bryan's connection to the film and its exhibition. Significantly, Bryan was one of the few gay filmmakers who used a variation of his legal name in the credits of his films. Jay Bryan joined a small group of filmmakers like Jack DeVoe, Fred Halstead, Wakefield Poole, and Tom DeSimone, who embraced the gay liberation ethic and visibility by not using a fabricated name. Aside from the reasons mentioned in this video that add to the film's significance, Seven in a Barn is one of the first gay hardcore movies made for theatrical release. It was shot almost entirely in a single setting, a straw-filled barn in which seven suntanned all-American men sit in a circle playing strip poker. It is by all accounts a Jay Bryan film. If you have not seen it, find it, Watch it and tell me what you think. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I'm your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, 
Discord. And if you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can help support this channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. Cheers.